So I would just like to say thank you very much, John, for joining us this evening. As I was saying to you earlier, I am absolutely gagging for Egyptology after Christmas and Boxing Day, which is not really my favourite um, holiday season, and especially this year, particularly weird. So um, I'm really delighted that you were able to join us today. Um, and I will hand over to you to tell us what you're going to talk about today and uh, tell us all about lunar law in ancient Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I'm delighted to be with you this evening. Um, it is, as you say, it's always very strange, that period between Christmas and New Year. Um, so it's nice to, to do something different. Um, I suppose we can go straight in. Uh, much has been written about the ancient Egyptian fascination with the sun and the fact that ancient Egypt is primarily deemed to be a culture which is built around solar deities. And we have the Reharachti um, with his solar disk and his Uraeus. And we have examples such as here we have the obelisk of Ramses II in Place de la Concorde in Paris. And we are always told that obelisks particularly topped with Electrum, as this one has quite recently been, um, are essentially solidified rays of the sun, solidified into stone. So, you know, this is, this is really quite, quite a determined effort to show adoration of the sun, of the sun's power. And then, of course, we turn to late New Kingdom, late 18th dynasty rather, and probably far too much has been written about Akhenaten and his 17 year reign of fascination with the art and sun disc. Um, I have a little thought on that that we will discuss later, but essentially I'm just, I'm just painting a very, very in broad strokes, the ongoing fascination by Egyptologists with the Egyptians' fascination with the sun. But what then of the moon? Um, we're used to seeing it in the night sky. It is our only substantial satellite, Earth's constant companion. Um, unlike the sun, it can be seen in some detail. The sun, certainly for the ancient Egyptians, couldn't be directly looked at. Uh, without causing injury or potentially blindness. But the moon can be looked at, can be observed, and therefore the changes to the moon as it passes through the heavens, as the light of the sun is reflected around the earth, was a source of constant fascination for the ancient Egyptians. Um, and we see various tales connected with the moon. And we also see the titles and epithets of deities and certain kings um, connected with the moon. Where does this come from? Well, the lecture comes from, quite straightforwardly, um, a huge exhibition that took place at the Royal Observatory Greenwich between the 9th of July and the 5th of January, uh, 2019 into 2020. And it was a fabulous exhibition to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the first Apollo moon landing, manned Apollo moon landing. And as a result of the exhibition, leading up to the exhibition, there was a publication. There's always a publication, and there should be too. I'm fond of buying catalogues. Um, but the moon catalogue was a determined effort, much like the exhibition itself, to bring together not just scientists, not just astronomers, but also art historians, um, historians, people like myself, um, people who are interested in ancient religions, ancient mythologies. And therefore I was asked to write a, a chapter for this, uh, looking at lunar law during the periods, the earliest periods through ancient Egypt and culminating in Rome, um, which gave me a great deal of fun to write about gorgons, vampires, werewolves, and deities. Um, but tonight we're going to concentrate totally on ancient Egypt. 
So let's have another look at an image of the moon. Um, and it's worth being aware of the fact that the moon that we see in the night sky is not always the same moon depending upon where you are in the world. We see it slightly differently. And we see the man in the moon um, because human beings, possibly animals too, but specifically human beings, suffer from a psychological condition um, called pareidolia, in which they like to see faces in things where faces don't exist. But it's a very northern and western idea of the world. So we look at the moon and we can see the man in the moon in various shapes, and of course it varies for everyone. But if we look at the moon in Egypt's western desert, we see it's, it's turned more on its side. It doesn't have the man in the moon face that we are used to in the UK. Um, it's closer to the equator. There's a definite tilt to it. So it's not quite the face that we're used to. And you can see it perhaps more clearly there. Um, it's instructive to see the way that the ancient Egyptians would still have looked for meanings, would still have perceived meanings in the face that was directed towards them. And of course, the moon, because of the way that it moves around the Earth, always directs the same face towards the Earth. But if we look here, we can see what appear to be two little eyes and a little snout with maybe a little slightly smiling mouth underneath. And up here, perhaps a lunar disk. And this is something that the ancient Egyptians leapt on from the earliest point. So we have this wonderful representation of a baboon, the great white one, Hedgewa, in the Berlin Neues Museum. And we know that this is very ancient because down here, just in front on the pedestal, is marked the name of Nama. So the idea that the ancient Egyptians might have been able to see this baboon face in the moon should not surprise us too greatly. However, there's more than that. If we look at this very, probably to most of you, very well recognized scene from the tomb of Tutankhamun, um, where we see the baboons staring off to the left with their tails coming up behind them, and then we go back and we look at the moon, uh, we can similarly see a sort of hunched figure here, possibly with a disc and with a tail that comes up behind. So effectively, depending upon which aspects of the moon one was considering, there may have been more than one baboon there. Um, it's difficult to know precisely what the Egyptians saw, but the Egyptians were satisfied that they saw this, this baboon in the moon, the, the, the great white one. We'll consider baboons a little more in a moment. Um, let's begin though properly with the first deity who is most associated with the moon popularly, and that's the god Thoth. And we have this wonderful Roman period um, wooden cover for a, for a wax board. Um, and we see the god Thoth, appropriately, because this is a writing board. So Thoth is there with his, with his lunar disc above his head. We have him also being represented here. We have, a, we have an image of Thoth being venerated by a falcon. And we also have a falcon addressing a baboon. Um, so it's interesting to see that there are various different aspects of, of lunar iconography on this one writing board, which is not specifically related to the moon. It's related to Thoth's work as a god of writing, um, a god of reckoning the passing of time also. We can see it further more here. Also, um, the last piece was in the Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology, and this piece is also, and we see a typical representation 
of Thorf, badly damaged because the bronze has been quite badly corroded. But again, with his lunar disc up here, if we have a look at the sacred ibis itself, upon which Thoth is based, uh, it's rather a nice image, uh, Threskionus Ethiopicus, um, then we can see the colouring would seem to be very startlingly white, but also we have aspects of shadow, um, which seems to tie in with, with the way that the moon changes, the way that the moon alters. So that seems to tie in with the waxing and waning of the moon. Um, and we see particularly in this beautiful late period mummy coffin, um, we can see not only the round shining aspect, but also we see that we see the crescent. So we see the two most important aspects of the moon for the ancient Egyptians drawn into the one figure. And here we have a wonderful little baboon with the two most important aspects again. We know that it's the moon that's being represented because the disc, which is frequently a sun's disc, we can identify it as being a lunar disc if it's sitting upon a crescent, as we see here. And we know that at Hermopolis, the Temple of Thoth would have been, the avenues of the Temple of Thoth were lined with enormous baboon statues, all showing the lunar iconography. Geraldine Pinch suggests that the lunar aspect of Thoth is the, of, is the offspring of Set and Horus. And of course, there is that very strange, very strange element from the contendings of Horus and Set, um, were Set having eaten his toxic lettuce, has Thoth come from a, a disc in his head? Um, it's very strange because in the, earlier in the tale, Thoth already exists. So this is a different aspect of Thoth which has been given birth to. Um, there's another myth that tells us the, the, the baboon form of Thoth is created specifically to rule the night sky as, if you like, a, a, a delegate, a, a proxy for Ray who will prevent man from fearing the dark. So the idea that we have this big glowing white baboon in the sky as a means of allowing man to exist in the darkness um, is a very interesting one. And we have from the tomb of Tutankhamun, we have this wonderful uh, ring which shows baboons barking at the moon. We know that baboons are in the habit of barking at the rising sun, and that's frequently a known aspect of Ray. But it's possible, I suppose, that they may well, at night, bark at a full moon also. Uh, again, we see the two most represented aspects, the full moon and the crescent, which Heinrich Schaefer suggests are the two most obvious ways for the Egyptians to reveal what it is that they're trying to show. Um, we, we don't have, it would be very un-Egyptian for them to show a baboon within the moon. So by showing the two aspects of the moon that are most recognizable, um, this is a way for the Egyptians to operate. And we'll see some more lunar iconography from the tomb of Tutankhamun very shortly. We have this wonderful little piece which is in the Cairo Museum and it was discovered when Pendlebury was at Amarna in 1932 for the Egypt Exploration Society. And we have this little scribe who appears to be taking dictation from the god Thoth in the form of a baboon. Um, it's from what's normally referred to as Waddington's workshop. And everyone always assumes that this is James Hillary Waddington, the architect who worked with, Peter, with Pendlebury at Amarna. But in fact, it's not. It's his wife, Ruth Waddington, um, who was responsible for the discovery of the workshop.
but of course in that wonderfully misogy misogynist way um, everyone forgets about Ruth and instantly thinks that it must be at James Hillary Waddington. It isn't. There is something that I do want to say about the baboon himself. Clearly he is supposed to be saying wonderful, exciting things that the scribe is, is writing down here. But I wonder if there's another reading. I wonder if this lunar disk and crescent moon are actually also indicative of the fact that they're giving light to the scribe to be able to write. And this idea that scribes might be able to use the light of the moon, um, not only to inspire themselves because the god Thoth is directly inspiring them, but also where you're dealing with just little oil lamps with a, within the home or, or even within the workplace, um, a good clear moon would be able to give you light to be able to work by. And I wonder if this is what we're seeing in this particular representation. I said that we would see some more of Tutankhamun lunar iconography, and let's do just that. This is the very well recognized pectoral from the mummy of Tutankhamun's tomb, and we have this wonderful central scarab, which Carter himself identifies as being Chalcedony. And of course, we now know it's not. It's, it is something from the heavens. It's meteoritic glass. Um, but then above it, we have the fact that we have this lunar representation here. And if we go on to the next slide, we can see a little more clearly what's happening. We have Thoth with his crescent and full moon. We have Rei Harakhti um, with, the, with the solar disk, but they are both represented on a moon um, adoring or supporting Tutankhamun, and Tutankhamun is himself wearing the lunar disk. And I wonder, we'll also see very shortly an image of the god Khonsu with the features of Tutankhamun, and I wonder whether there is so much lunar iconography connected with Tutankhamun as a means of trying to diminish the Artanist iconography that existed during the reign of his father, um, that we have discs appearing all over the place, but they are not the hated Arten, they are the moon. Um, and I think that's a very interesting religio religio-political situation that we're looking at there. Um, let me go back to the next one. Having dealt in the most cursory manner with Thoth, um, a somewhat lesser known Egyptian deity is Yach. And here we have a very nice little bronze of Yach. His name is normally written, written, written with a lunar determinative, excuse me, And in its very earliest use, he is not so much a deity as a physical representation of the moon. Um, in time, he goes on to become a god in his own right. And it's been suggested that it's, it's possible that because of moon deities from Syrian, from Babylonian cultures, that they, they may have sort of influence the idea of turning the moon into a into a, a human manifestation um, and that seems particularly to happen with the Hyksos followers followers and that following the close of the Middle Kingdom. Now we have a very interesting tale that's told if I can but find the um part of my notes. Oh yes, there we are. Uh, we have a very interesting tale that's told about Iach, and we have this wonderful representation of the goddess Nut from the Book of the Dead, normally known as Papyrus Greenfield, um, and it's the Book of the Dead of Neseten Nebis Heru, and it's late 21st, early 22nd dynasty. It is vast, it's 37 meters long, 
Um, and it's there just for me to explain for those of you who don't already know who the goddess Nut is. The goddess Nut, you will see, is above Geb, who is the earth down here. And we're told that the god Ray, fearing that he might be deposed, or otherwise overthrown by the children of Geb and Nut, tells Nut that she will never become pregnant, she will never bear children on any day of the year. And of course, his words are very, very important. She, she will never become, she will never give birth on any day of the, the year. And the god Thoth takes pity on her for this and decides that he will speak to Yach about seeing if there's any way that other days might be made available. In the end, he decides that he will go to Yach and engage with him in a game of Senet. And they gamble. And apparently Yark is very fond of gambling. And again, I wonder whether this is something that tells us more about the ancient Egyptians than is normally realized. <coughs> Perhaps it's one of those things that happened after dark in homes that people would sit and game and gamble. Um, not so different from us playing board games, particularly during lockdown. Um, but the idea that Yark is particularly taken with this pastime. So, probably is rather unfairly matched, given that Thoth is great of intellect. Um, he goes into this game, and over a period of time, he wins no less than five separate days. He asks Yark for a portion of moonlight each time he wins a game. Eventually, he ends up with five separate days, which allows Nut to give birth to Osiris, to Horus the Elder, to Set, to Isis, and to Nephthys. Don't worry too much about Horus the Elder. It's one of those wonderfully confusing things that the ancient Egyptians do. We still have Horus the Younger, who is the offspring of Osiris and Isis. But in this way, we have the birth of some of the most important deities from, from ancient Egypt. But in addition to that, in the real world, rather than the mythological world, it gives us a 360-day calendar with five additional days, bringing us up to 365 days. So these epagominal or intercalary days actually make what we require um, for a full lunar year. What it doesn't take into account, of course, are leap years. And that's something the ancient Egyptians never really got their heads around. But that's not for this discussion at all. But it is, but it is interesting to see the fact that the fact that the moon is so important in the, in the creation of these deities and that Thoth is also important. It's cementing Thoth's importance as a lunar deity, um, whilst at the same time telling us something about the nature of Yach. We have this wonderful little object, which is in the British Museum. It's a little solid cast bronze and it is Hans, Yach, and Thoth, all combined. So all of the moon you could ever want in one tiny little bronze figurine. And we see lots and lots of lunar iconography here. So we have Khonsu, we know it's Khonsu because of the side lock of youth there. Um, but it's also Yach and he's wearing his lunar headdress, which is topped by Thoth, who is also wearing a lunar headdress. So it, it is the most lunar object you can possibly imagine. Um, but having discussed Khonsu briefly there, let's have a look a little more in a little more detail. We have this wonderful Khonsu statuette discovered in 1903. 
sorry, statue, not statuette. Um, and it's Khonsu Heseb Akau, the reckoner of lifespans. And when we see him properly complete, this is the same statue, but restored. Um, it's very interesting. Khonsu is the son of Amun and Mut in Thebes. He is known as Khonsu the Traverser. So the idea that he, of him moving across the sky is immediately explicit. But Khonsu is interesting because we know of him first from the pyramid texts and from a portion of the pyramid texts known as the Cannibal Hymn. And it appears within the pyramids of Unas and Teti, and thereafter on coffins in the Middle Kingdom. And it tells the, tells the tale of the king in death, meeting up with Khonsu, and I'll give you the quotation. Khonsu who slew the lords, who strangles them for the king and extracts for him what is in their bodies. And he is referred to in the coffin text as Khonsu who lives on hearts. So this idea of Khonsu taking power from the other gods in order to feed the king after death is a very, very, it's quite a shocking idea. Um, I'm not quite sure what it really is trying to tell us beyond the fact that I think it's some sort of indication of the terrors of the darkness, of the fear that occurs to people when it's dark outside and the moon rises, or worse, when it's dark outside and the moon is obscured. This idea that Khonsu is, is a murderer of other deities. Of course, you can't murder other deities. Set tried that and it didn't work terribly well. Um, but this idea that he's able to take their power by force in order to give it to the king is, is very, very interesting. Um, as you can see, Khonsu is an anthropomorphic deity. He's essentially momiform, which again perhaps ties in with the idea of him being connected with, with death, albeit the death of others. Um, again, we see the sidelock of youth here. And we'll discuss that in a moment. But essentially, he is, he is a mummiform deity. Um, he is sometimes referred to as Khonsu Khenesu, uh, the placenta, Khonsu, the placenta of the king, which gives the idea of him being connected with childbirth in some respect. Um, and again, as we've already heard, the idea of him being called the Traverser, the Traveller, who, who moves across the sky. So Khonsu is a very complex deity, and we can see some of that here. Uh, this is a plan of Karnak Temple, and down here in the southwest corner, uh, we have Khonsu Temple itself. And we have some wonderful photographs um, taken between 1862 and 1905. I would say that's earlier rather than later by Antonio Biato. Um, Consu Temple is built by Ptolemy III. There's an avenue of rams leading up to it. And then here we see it, it's fronted by statues of Khonsu as a baboon with the lunar insignia upon its head. So we have Khonsu being connected with Thoth here. Um, the interior of the temple was begun by Ramesside kings and then later worked on by some of the Libyan kings, but ultimately it's the Ptolemaic and Roman kings king emperors, um, who do the most work with Khonsu Temple. Um, it's worth pointing out that we see him at Karnak. 
being represented there, as we've seen him already with the side lock of youth, with the lunar insignia standing behind, sorry, this is, this is from Komombo, um, standing behind Sebek. Um, and at Komombo, he is part of a triad. He is, he is the child of Sebek and Hathor. Um, and at Edfu, Khonsu is also referred to as the son of the leg. And we see a very interesting thing happening at Edfu because he's referred to as son of the leg because they actually believe that they hold a leg of Osiris at Edfu Temple. Something that we're not used to encountering at all. Um, they have a leg of Osiris and Khonsu is connected to Osiris and we'll see some more of this later. Um, so the idea of this relic down there is very interesting. It's been suggested that when we see Khonsu here, with this side lock of youth, um, this is Khonsu, the child. This is the new moon that's being represented. This is from Karnak in the Hyperstyle Hall. And then here, also in Karnak, at Khonsu Temple, we have the full moon being represented. Side lock of youth is gone. He's a falcon. And it's not always easy to tell precisely what it is that's being represented, particularly when there is no color left. But if you look carefully, you can see that this is not a solar disk. It is actually sitting atop the crescent. A very narrow crescent, but a crescent nonetheless. Um, and that becomes even more confusing when when the crescent almost entirely disappears and we have what appears to be solar plumes. Um, so it's not always difficult to be, a, it's not always easy rather to be able to recognize Konsu when one sees him. However, there is a fabulous story connected with the god Konsu and it comes from this piece in the Louvre and it is a, it's a large piece of sandstone, 2.22 meters high by one meter wide. And it's referred to normally as the Bentresh Stealer. And it tells a very interesting tale. A very interesting tale which suggests that we shouldn't take everything the ancient Egyptians tell us at first hand. It tells the tale of Ramses II visiting Bakhtan. Uh, in Greek, that's Bactria. In Egyptian, it's Nahrin. And there, Ramesses II meets and falls in love with the daughter of a local prince. And she returns with him to Egypt, where she marries Ramesses II, becomes his great royal wife, and adopts the purely Egyptian name, Nefrure. And some years pass. And then in year 23, messages are received at the Egyptian court from Bakhtan that Nefrure's younger sister, Ben Tresh, has been afflicted by demonic possession. And this is something that we don't often see in ancient Egypt. So the royal scribe from the House of Life, Thothem Heb, is dispatched and he travels all the way out to Bakhtan, Bactria, and he is unsuccessful in releasing or otherwise exorcising this demon. So he travels all the way back and in year 26, so three years later, the problem is still continuing. So we have this idea that the message has come that he has gone and returned, and it's, and it's a long, long, long journey. So a second request is sent, and the Prince of Bakhtan requests a god to be sent. And on this occasion, the king, Ramses II, suggests that Cons Consu Neferhotep should be approached. Neferhotep meaning the merciful. And we have Khonsu Neferhotep being approached. 
and he gives permission therefore to send one of his other representations to send Konsu Payasekha, Payasekha meaning the provider. So Konsu Payasekha is dispatched. The cult statue of Konsu Payasekha is dispatched to Bakhtan, to Nahrin, with five boats and a chariot. And it takes, of course, as we've already said, a tremendously long time for him to arrive there. But we're told that his work is done almost immediately. He arrives and the demon realizes the great power of the god who's in front of him and leaves Ventresh. So offerings are made by the prince, by all present, to Khonsu, and a feast day is held for both he and, somewhat strangely, the demon, I suppose, in gratitude for the demon having left her. However, the god and his retinue spend three years and nine months out there. And it seems that the prince, maybe he's worried that it's going to reoccur. It seems that the prince doesn't want to return Khonsu, the provider, to Karnak Temple. So eventually he has a dream in which the god appears as a golden falcon. And he realizes that the god must indeed be returned to Egypt. And he sends the god back with gifts of every good thing and horses and riders. And the provider arrives back at the temple of Khonsu in Karnak and delivers these gifts to Khonsu the Merciful upon his return to Thebes. And he arrives back eventually in year 33. So this whole nonsense has been going on for 10 years since the initial since the initial request was sent. And everyone, I suppose, lives happily ever after, apart from the demon. Um, but it does sort of indicate the ways in which the different forms of the god operate with each other. We have the idea that the more powerful one is approached and he sends another version of himself out there to, to do the dirty work, I suppose. Um, which is very interesting indeed. The fact that it goes into such detail um, is also very interesting. There are, however, problems. Here we see Ramesses II. And Ramesses II, a man who was certainly known never to undersell himself, appears never to have been to Bactria. Tutmosis I went, and so did Tutmosis III, but we have no knowledge whatsoever of Ramesses II going there. In actual fact, the tale and the way that things operate with the tale seems to relate more to Alexander, Alexander the Great, because we know that Alexander the Great does go to Bactria. We know that he marries and leaves Bactria with Roxanne. So there's clearly a much, much later aspect to this whole tale. And it's been suggested by no less than Kim Ryholt um, that this is actually a Ptolemaic tale that's being written during the Ptolemaic period and set in, for them, the ancient past, which gives Khonsu much greater power why might this be? Well, we've already indicated that the Ptolemies are very, very keen on Khonsu as a deity. But we also know that Ptolemy IV, Ptolemy Philopater, um, takes the epithet, beloved of Khonsu, who protects the king and drives away evil spirits. And we don't really have much to go on apart from this peculiar epithet we can surmise, I suppose, that something similar may have befallen the king, that it may be said that he had been demonically possessed and that Konsu, Konsu had healed him. And in order to strengthen Konsu's power, 
as a national deity, um, this story may have been told as a means of throwing that power further back in time and perhaps indicating that it wasn't the first time that such things had happened and that, um, that it really wasn't a problem with Ptolemy IV at all. Although, of course, we know that there are all sorts of problems with the Ptolemies, which is one of the things that makes them fascinating. Um, there are other aspects, though, of the Mun and the Mun's involvement, which we should consider. And we have this wonderful representation from the reign of Shoshenk, um, from the mummy of Shoshenk II, from Tanis. And we have the left, the lunar eye of Horus. And why do we have the lunar eye of Horus? Well, we're told that the right eye of Horus is the sun, and the left eye becomes the moon. It becomes the moon because the gods set during the contendings of these two gods, transforms himself into a black bull, and with his front hoof, gouges out the eye. Doesn't fully gouge out the eye, but sufficiently damages the left eye of Horus. Which allows us then, this damaged eye, which is healed by Thoth again, um, then becomes a shorthand version of being able to represent fractions for the Egyptians and hieroglyphs, and you can see the each of the each of the um, elements making up the left eye of Horus has a different arithmetical figure attached to it. But there's also another story about Set um, turning himself into black pig, which devours the moon, and once again it's up to Thoth to cause Set to, to spit out the moon, but it's already damaged, the damage is already done. So again, we have this idea of it being at different points in the month, damaged before it becomes entirely whole again. Whilst we're discussing bulls, um, it's worth looking at this particular character, um, the Apis bull, although this is from the Ptolemaic period, we're told that the Apis bull, which is I'd always thought of it more as, a, as Egypt's only example of reincarnation, but it's been suggested by Aidan Dodson that it might in fact be an avatar. This idea of the bull being identified by the way that it looks, and after each bull dies, the priests have to go out and find another bull which exactly fulfills the physical criteria. Um, so the physical criteria were told, are that the bull should be black and white, which ties in with the, um, with the colors of the moon that we've already seen on the ibis, that there should be a solar disc on the flank, which of course we can't see in this representation. Um, but we have the horns, and the horns are very important because the horns with a solar disc above them immediately transform into the crescent moon with a lunar disc above. And we see this in other cultures. We see it particularly in the Roman culture, where we see little horns um, being projected with, with a lunar disc above. And we'll see a lot of that as we move forward through time. There is, however, something else that I'd like to speak about. Um, and this is a very interesting figure. We don't have too many of them. But it's Osiris, represented with lunar attributes. And John Gwynne Griffiths, a great scholar of ancient Egyptian religion, refers to this figure as Osiris Yach, Osiris the Moon. Um, and what precisely are we seeing here? We see another representation here, where the, where the, the lunar aspects are very, very evident. It's been suggested by Baro that the 14 parts of Osiris' body, when, when Set murders him and then eventually chops the parts up and throws them into the Nile, the 14 parts of Osiris' body are connected to the 14 days of the waning moon. So what we see here is 
And we see another representation there. What we see here then is the moon dying, joining Osiris. So we've already seen the new moon, we've seen the full moon, and now I think what we're seeing here is a representation of the waning moon and the moon's dissolution, the, the dissolution entirely. Um, there's no mummiform aspect really, that, well there is here, but there wasn't in the previous one, but it is still Osiris that's being represented. Again, we can see the mummiform aspect there. Um, there aren't many of these representations, but there's clearly some thought because, it, because it's such a peculiar conglomeration of different iconographies to create these figures. And then we see Robert Rittner writes a very interesting paper about Anubis and lunar aspects of Anubis. Um, this is from the temple of Edfu, and it's been thought that this may have been a representation of the moon. But no, Rittner is satisfied that this is in fact a representation of some sort of tambourine. But he is satisfied that there are representations of Anubis with the moon. And they seem to be the representations where, where it's a larger disc that he's that he's using um and he's bent forward and this idea of him being bent forward ties in with his position in the embalming process that we see um of anubis bending forward in order to to tie up the the bandages of the deceased um and these two reliefs that we see here these two line drawings of reliefs are from Dendera and from the birth house of Hatshepsut at the, at the Temple of Deir al-Bakhri. So what we see are representations of Anubis with the moon in birth scenarios. And it's been suggested that this is Anubis even at the time of the king's birth, getting ready for the eventual rebirth and therefore moving the moon into place to allow for the king's rebirth. <laughs> Later, during the Roman period, we have this wonderful representation of Anubis as psychopomp. We know that he's psychopomp because of the staff that he's carrying. So psychopomp taking the dead down into the underworld. And again, we see the increase in lunar imagery that starts to, starts to develop during the Roman period. And we can see quite clearly that this is in fact the moon atop a crescent. Um, so for the Romans, we begin to see a lot of connection between lunar aspects and also, I think, death. Um, I suppose for the Romans, this, this goes, the two go hand in hand, the moon and night going hand in hand with death. Um, so we see representations there. We have the moon, these, this, is a, this is a mummy shroud, which is now in Berlin, and it's from the Hellenistic period, and we see the moon being represented and actually on this occasion the crescent is on the side rather than on the base and we also see Anubis there on a different mummy shroud also in Berlin um, fastening the swathings of the mummy um, but the moon here the moon's disc with the crescent appears more as a a sort of halo hovering behind uh, rather than being represented between the ears of the god. And then we begin to see something very interesting happening during the Roman period with Isis. There's a standard representation of the goddess Isis. She has the, um, she has the Hathor horns, she has the, she has the sun's disc, she has the solar disc, 
Um, but then we start to see representations of Isis once we move into the Hellenistic period, where she's being represented with a crescent moon. We see further representations a little later on, where she also has the crescent moon and also sometimes the full moon. One thing that I did want to comment on at this point, and I think it's an important thing, is the way in which Selene, the Egyptian goddess of the moon, uh, sorry, the, the Greek goddess of the moon, becomes incorporated into Isis. And there are probably good political reasons for this. It happens specifically during the reign of Cleopatra VII. And if she is the goddess Isis, then it seems sensible that her two children should be called Helios, um, the sun, and her daughter is called Selene, the moon. And we have this wonderful gilt plate from Boscoriali, um, which is a little villa not far, not far from Pompeii. Um, and we see Selene represented here. Selene is one of the few members of Cleopatra's family to survive her death. And there she is being represented holding, holding this horn of plenty, essentially, um, which is topped by the moon, by the crescent moon. And she, she is shown wearing an elephant skin cap in the same manner as Alexander the Great often did. But if one looks at it in the right way, you can see that these tusks are also showing the crescent moon in the same way that we see bull's horns uh, showing the crescent moon. So you can see a little more clearly perhaps there. Uh, they're horns, but they're also moon-like. Selene goes on to marry Juba the second and becomes queen of Mauritania and they have a son called Ptolemy of Mauritania. He eventually is murdered by his distant cousin Caligula but that's not for today that's for another day. She dies very early. Um, she dies aged only 35 and her death coincides with a lunar eclipse on the 23rd of March 5 BC. And we know this because Cronagoras of Mytilene uh, writes a poem in which he says, the moon herself grew dark, rising at sunset, covering her suffering in the night, because she saw her beautiful namesake, Selene, breathless, descending to Hades with her. She had her, the beauty of, she had, she had had the beauty of her light in common and mingled her own darkness with death. So we have the fact that we have daughter of Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra, who at the time of her death, poems are being written about the connection between the moon, the, the moon and the human individual. And then as time goes on, uh, we have this representation uh, found in a merchant ship at Caesarea of the goddess Luna from 400 AD, so getting quite late. Um, and we can see that she is represented with the crescent moon. So Luna is taking on these very Egyptian looking aspects. And then we have a representation here of Isis. We know it's Isis because she has the famous Isis knot in her robes. And this is 3rd century AD, and it's Isis with entirely lunar iconography. We can see, as I keep pointing out to you, we can see the crescent moon topped by the lunar disk. Um, and then again, we see further representations of Isis again with the knot. So Isis, although she doesn't become, although she doesn't begin as a lunar deity in the eyes of the Romans, and it's the Romans who take Isis as far afield as the United, the United Kingdom, as Britain, um, we know that there's a temple to Isis 
somewhere beneath Tully Street in London. Um, and she spends a great deal of her latter life as a lunar deity. What's very strange, though, is we, we see the incorporation of Isis, who is great of magic, into other deities as well. So we have this wonderful representation of Hecate Triformus. Hecate is great of magic. She is, she is, a, she is a witch goddess in the same sort of ways as Isis was a sorceress. She is great of magic. She may be Anatolian originally. We don't quite know from where she comes, but it's been suggested that her name Hecate is a corruption of the Egyptian goddess Heket, who is a goddess of childbirth. Uh, this particular representation is from Anatolia. And I think what we are seeing here are the different aspects. So Hecate, Demeter, and Persephone, um, but they are all in some way connected with Isis. Um, and she has, the, she, she has one of her epithets as Queen of the Crescent Moon. So if this is where ultimately in the eyes of the Romans, we see Isis going and being incorporated into this enormously powerful sorceress deity, um, it's very interesting then to see in one of Shakespeare's plays, this is, this is a wonderful image here, uh, which shows Macbeth. It's, it's based on a, a Joshua Reynolds painting, which is now in Petworth, uh, but it's a beautiful etching by Robert Thew from 1802. And it represents a scene from act, oh, I don't have a note of which act it's from, but it's a scene from Shakespeare's Macbeth, and here is Macbeth. Um, and here are the three witches, one hidden down there, one there, one there. And in the midst of all of this is Hecate, who is wearing the sort of um, suffibulum headdress that religious women from ancient Rome would have worn. Um, so it's very interesting to see that ultimately this may be where Isis ends up. Um, being incorporated into British tales of mythology and magic, which have almost no connection with ancient Egypt. The main connection that exists throughout it all is the connection with the moon and with things happening under cover of darkness. I probably said enough now, um, but I'm sure that many of you will have questions and I'd be delighted to take your questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. That was absolutely fascinating. I've got a few questions and then um, I'll open it up. Also, if you are shy and don't want to ask your question yourself, then please put it in the chat. There's no need for shyness. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Hebsed and potential regicide. And uh, I was reading something recently about uh, the Minoans having a lunar solar calendar and having their, um, their rulership dictated by like long-term lunar phases. Was, yeah. was there anything within Hebsed that would indicate something like a uh, lunar dictated length of a reign? No, I, I, I can't see anything specific there. Um, excuse me. Apart, apart simply for, for, from the fact that, that I suppose the kings have a slightly longer reign um, because they get five additional days a year out of it. <laughs> uh, directly, because, directly because of the moon's intervention. Uh, but no, I'm not aware of a lunar aspect to Heb said. If anyone knows, then please feel free to correct me. But I'm not aware of anything. I can't remember who I was talking to. It was either Aidan or uh, maybe Paul Harrison. Was We were talking about the idea of Hebsed perhaps being, I think, was it a 30-year 
Ruler. That's right. Yes, it starts yeah. off as thirty years. Yes, yeah. thirty, and then it gets longer and longer. And was it supposed to be that the power was taken away from the king after thirty years? So after that vitality had diminished. Well, he ha he has he has to prove that he still yeah. has vitality. Power. And instead of it getting longer and longer, it gets shorter and shorter. Uh, okay. And we have some kings. We have some kings um, celebrating a hebsad every couple of years, from quite earlier on in the you know. Kings that don't have terribly long reigns in the scheme of things, celebrating a number of hebsads. Mm. So there are two possibilities for that. There is the fact that you're showing from the outset that you're still able to be king, and maybe there are sound political reasons for that. Um, but maybe it's just giving the people an opportunity to get drunk and eat a lot at the king's expense. Mm. And it's an excuse for a celebration that's specifically related to the ongoing power of the king. Because of course, there are numerous celebrations in ancient Egypt. Almost every other day is a holiday of some, mm. religious holiday of some description. Um, but something that's specifically related to the king's power and ongoing power is, all, is always a very good idea. Um, from a political point of view, I think, mm. but I but I still can't think of any lunar aspects to it. But maybe that maybe that would be worth further investigation. And um, with Iark, is he um, holding sometimes a uh, palm frond? Because doesn't the palm frond with the notches on dictate time passing? We let me see if I can find him. I think mainly. No, I think, I think it was the one. The, represent, the representations he's he's holding, he's holding a little. I don't think I can make that any larger. He's holding a little. Sorry, I'm trying to get a closer look at it. He's he's holding a little solar, not lunar eye there. Um, I haven't seen representations of palm fronds. Sometimes Thoth holds a palm frond as a reckoner of days. Mm. Um, but I'm not so used to the idea of Iach holding one. Again, he seems, to, he seems to again have a little... Interestingly, he seems again to have a little solar wadjet eye there. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting in itself. Now, now that you bring it up, the, the idea that, that this, as I said, possibly the most lunar of lunar representations is holding a little solar representation also. Mm. And that... maybe, maybe part of that is that the ancient Egyptians view the moon as being an aspect of the sun, as yeah. we've said from the outset, this idea that the moon is put up there to keep people happy whilst the sun's at rest. Um, is there an idea but, but it's, 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 a de it's a deputization of the sun's strength. Is there, is there an idea of uh, the moon being the source of light in the afterlife? Like the moon being a sort of shadow aspect of the sun in, in some way? Well, of course we, we have, we have, we have the solar bark traversing the whole of the skies during the day and during the night when you go into the underworld. So there's certainly, there's a lunar aspect to that. Um, but I think this is more about, not so much, I think these representations are more about this deputization thing rather than being specifically connected to death. I think we can certainly see the connections with death when we look at the little Osiris yachts, which are fascinating in themselves. Um, and actually they tie in quite nicely with our own ideas of death and the moon and the afterlife. Um, so, it, so it is interesting and somewhat unusual to see the same ideas cropping up in the minds of the ancient Egyptians. 
because they're fairly rare, but clearly at some level, that's precisely what they were thinking. Um, and with regard to lunar iconography following Akhenaten, do you think Akhenaten's kind of attempt at monotheism um, influenced later monotheistic traditions? Was that the starting point for it, do you think? Oh, it's certainly the starting point, but of course the, there are a lot of other things happening before we get to anything approaching monotheism. Was on, thought on a larger of scale, uh, but I but I definitely do get sorry. Sorry, I was just was was Thoth one of the gods was, that was still kind of allowed during Akhenaten's reign, perhaps because well, he was ev really evidently because we have we have the representation at Waddington's workshop. Mm. But then that may be that may be an earlier piece that the sculptor brought with him to Amarna because he was particularly taken by it, because, because it appealed to him, because it was a good example of what he could do with stone. Um, th there may be all sorts of reasons why, but no, there isn't really, I can't think of any attested examples. Although of course we have, we have the name crop up. We know that there are certainly at least one Tutmosis at Amarna because there's another sculpture's, work, another sculpture's workshop. Um, but people's names are very, very interesting. You really can't turn all of the deities and people's names into Aten mm. because that would be confusing as hell. Um, you can certainly do it with the king because there's only one king. Um, but you can't do it with every individual in the street. I guess as well, if the moon was seen as being, having this relationship with the sun, as being a companion to the sun, then the moon having some power during Artanism wouldn't be very Yeah, um, it's, it's entirely possible that there is more work there to be done on where the moon fits in. Again, there are discs that hang in the heavens one of them being gold, the other one silver. Mm. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's done a great deal of work in those terms, but it would be interesting to see what people come up with. I'm it, won't be, it won't be me because I, I've done enough with, with Amana and the Aten for a lifetime, thank you. <laughs> Probably, I guess, Egyptians didn't think that the moon emanated its own light. They recognised that it reflected the light of the sun. No, I think the ancient Egyptians were fully expecting the moon to emanate it. So, and therefore, what, what it saw was, what, what the Egyptians saw were not shadows. They were different aspects of the moon dying off and then being reborn, mm. um, which ties in very nicely with these aspects of Horus' left eye being damaged by set. Mm -hmm. and then Thoth allowing them to regrow. So every, every month you get to see this as it gets damaged and becomes darker and then it comes back again. Um, no, no, for the ancient Egyptians, they would have believed that it was glowing with its own light. Okay, I've got one more question, then I'm going to ask everyone else's. Um, okay. What about lunar magic? Like the relationship, obviously, between Thoth and magic and writing and magic and... Um, are there specific references to particular lunar phases being powerful for magical work and spells and things like that? I think it's, I think it's more to do with, I think it's more to do with that fascination that human beings have with the mystery and the thrill and the excitement of, of being in the dark with mm. just the light of the moon. And therefore, if magic is going to occur, it's certainly going to occur in those circumstances because it's much more thrilling, it's much more exciting. It plays upon the mind mm. in ways that magic performed in broad daylight doesn't quite have that mystique, doesn't quite have that thrill. Um, so so I, I think 
the magic the magical aspect and the moon go hand in hand just because it's under cover of darkness. I guess there is perhaps uh, an auspicious element of a full moon in terms of yeah. the fear that yeah. Egyptians had of the darkness and the chaos that resided within the darkness under the protection of the full moon. Absolutely, it's absolutely. Safe. Whereas in Egypt, <laughs> in Egypt, unlike in the UK or in Europe, every day you were under the complete glare of the sun um but it's only once a month that you get the complete glare of the moon so yes those would be specifically auspicious days um okay. right let's just see what other people have asked here uh, i have a quick question oh here we go yeah i'll ask other people's questions but please do do you chip in? Okay, uh, does the lunar representation have anything to do with enlightenment and, um, you know, reincarnation when the brightness keeps getting renewed each month? And does it have anything, any aspect of the tides changing, does that have anything to do with any of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think we've seen with the red, with and unfortunately, I don't even have to change the slide. We, ha we have this idea of Osiris Yach, um, and the fact that we have the, f the body being cut into 14 parts, tying in with the 14 days of the waning moon. And then suddenly we're back to square one again, and the 14 days build back up again into a glorious full moon. Um, and it ties in very nicely with the fact that we have the full moon being represented as falcon headed uh, so that ties in with osiris being dead horus coming from osiris and being vibrant and filled with life so there are definitely those aspects of it and again with the with the gouging of of horus eye into those different pieces um and then becoming full again, becoming healed again by Thoth. Um, I, I think those are, those are it, it's all about rebirth and refurbishment. I don't, don't, I'm always wary about reincarnation with the Egyptians, but certainly rebirth and renewal. May I ask a question? Thank you, of course, yes. Um, so I also study Egyptology and I uh, do Northeast African archeology. span And I'm wondering if in your research, you've come across any traditions in Africa at large that correlate to the lunar practices in Egypt. I'm, I'm specifically thinking in Sudan, Ethiopia, Northeast Africa or, or abroad, but um, we've talked a lot about Greece and, and Minoan and I'm wondering yeah. about the African connection. I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I don't I, Egypt is hugely influenced by Africa and one must always remember that Egypt is African um, that there's there's an immediate line of connection that runs through Egyptian culture from African culture unfortunately Africa is not one of my areas the fact that we concentrated latterly upon Greece and Rome is because those are two of my areas so um, I know that work has been done, a great deal of work has been done on lunar religion mythology in Africa, uh, but unfortunately it's, it's outside of my area of, of research. Thank you anyway for an excellent lecture. Appreciate Thank you, that's very kind. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Jane, yes, Go on. Oh, sorry. Go on, Carly. Hi, I was wondering if the advent of Yah as a theophoric element in names of the early 18th dynasty, such as Amos, Amos Nefertari, etc., had any significance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dynasty's origin and or um, any of its political ramifications. I think, I think it's because of the way that we see Egyptian deities being informed 
by the religious practices of the Hyksos and those from further east. Um, when, when gods, unless, unless you're dealing with Arkan Arten and the Arten, when gods are brought across and adopted in that way, I think I said that really until the close of the Middle Kingdom, beginning of the New Kingdom, we see Iach essentially as a personification of the moon rather than as a moon deity. Um, and I think the Egyptians being largely syncretistic, once one has introduced a deity, um, you don't go about then just brushing them off into a corner and forgetting about them. So the fact that we have these names occurring at this point so close to the Hyksos reign, um, I think is indicative of the fact that we have this new fully fledged bona fide deity in the firmament. Uh, but as previously, it had just been a personification of the of the celestial disc. So yes, I, th I think there is a connection. Um, and in the same way that we see those names dying out fairly fast, as he are, gets incorporated, but is somewhat less special. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Does the um, the idea that the uh, lunar disc is a female de deity come from somewhere else? Do you think? Because obviously in Egypt at the beginning, it was the both the solar disc and the lunar disc were seen as male entities. Yeah. And then, do you think influence comes from elsewhere to introduce this idea of the moon being feminine? The moon seems in a great many cultures to have feminine aspects. And I think, I think we've shown that, that really it's only with Hellenistic and Roman influences that we see the moon becomes conflated with Selene, conflated with Luna. And then Isis sort of incorporates both of those deities. Um, because Isis becomes quite big in the Roman world. Mm, I wonder if there, there, are could... lots of, there are lots of temples of Isis. Yeah, I wonder if there could be any connection with the menstrual cycle as well, and the the knot of Isis and the blood of Isis, and those ideas there coming. There up. are there are certainly as, there are certainly aspects of, of that, and one of the not in Egypt at all, um, but in Lausanne, uh, we have prehistoric carvings of what would appear to be a naked woman holding a crescent moon which is marked with days that correspond to the menstrual cycle. So, so there, there are definitely these sorts of ideas happening in different cultures. But it's always difficult, unless you have hard evidence of it, it's always difficult to say, ah, oh, yes, it's happening here and here, so it must have been happening in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that it wasn't. It's just much more difficult to prove unless you have clear evidence. Is there any connection, do you think, in your professional opinion, between the name Yah and then the emergence of the same Yah later in Hebrew? I don't think so. I've seen it suggested on a number of occasions. Um, no, I, I would be very worried about going down that route, not least because the conventions that we Egyptologists use for pronunciation don't necessarily follow the conventions that the ancient Egyptians would have used for the pronunciation. So although we have Yach, um, that may not be how the Egyptians said it, and it's not—it's not the way that all—it's not the way that all Egyptologists say it either. <laughs> so I—I I think I wouldn't put it any higher than just being coincidence. So, uh, following up on Sarah Jane's question about magic, yeah, uh, since Thoth is the god—you know—the god of strong Heka or magic. Yeah. Uh, what about, and the moon is associated with dreams. Um, could, in your researches, have you come across any um, 
you know, any uh, uh, descriptions of, say, like the influence of the moon or Thoth or Yah on the moon, on dreams, especially prof prophetic dreams and the intersection of Heka, prophetic dreams, and um, the moon? The Egyptians are very keen on the idea of prophetic dreams. Um, I'm just trying to think. Whilst prophetic dreams for the ancient Egyptians are something that, that you know, dream books are written and there's a whole list of things that if you dream that you are doing X, Y, and Z, it means that A, B, and C will happen. I don't see anything that I don't see anything that is that allows humanity to influence its own dreams um, if, if that's if that, that there are no to my knowledge there are no magical spells which allow you to dream specific things um, I think the ancient Egyptians took the very sensible idea that you dream what you dream um, and there may be reasons for that, but you can't influence those dreams. And therefore, the, the idea of magic and dreams, whilst connected, are not... Whilst connected, they're connected in a purely prophetic way, rather than if you have a dream on a night of the full moon or if you dream about this at the beginning of the new moon, then this will happen. Um, I haven't found any evidence of that. They did try to protect themselves from demons and, and nightmares a lot. And I, I do think, like we were saying before, that potentially the full moon could be a good time for not having nightmares because of the protection of the moon's light, perhaps. But I, think, know, I, I, think we mustn't, I think we mustn't ever forget the physical circumstances of ancient Egypt, where after the sun has set, apart from a few little glowing oil lamps and fires, um, you're plunged into pretty much darkness. So the comfort that would be given by a clear shining white orb in the sky would be considerable. And I think the idea of it being protective and chasing off demons, uh, because of course, you know, the human species has this idea that terrible things are going to happen in the dark, as I think I said. Um, so something that brightens that darkness can only be a good thing. Um, and therefore, that's why we have these these different aspects of the division of the moon, the, the darkening of the moon, and then the moon lightening again, are very, very important to the Egyptians. And I think it's, it's interesting that two of those examples, specifically three of those examples specifically, relate to the chaos being wrought by the god Set. Um, we, have, we have the pig swallowing the moon, we have the we have the bull gouging at the moon, and we have Osiris being chopped into fourteen different parts and thrown into the Nile. Um, so the idea that that the moon can be damaged in this way and can 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 lessen your protection after dark, mm. I think, is very important. And I think there's something there's something that we're missing. Um, there's always something that we're missing when we deal with ancient Egypt because the number of religious texts that we have are slight at best. It seems as if everything that we have from ancient Egypt has a religious aspect. And that's often the case, but they're not always terribly self-explanatory. Um, what we are missing is the sort of folk belief and folk magic that the people who worked in the fields, the people who lived in little towns, not the state religion, which is somewhat monolithic and guided by priests and by the king, but the beliefs of the people, um, I think, would be far more telling if we had some way of, 
of grasping that information, I think we could learn a great deal more about the moon and the, the position of the moon in the beliefs of the people. Can I ask something? Yes, yes of course. Um, the depiction of the lunar crescent, particularly later on with those images of Isis, look awfully like devil horns. Is there any connection? <laughs> Um, well, I suppose that, de that depends on your frame of mind. Um, the d they definitely come to be depicted as horns. Mm -hmm. And we see the fact that, for instance, the, the, the Roman goddess Luna has, has two oxen with crescent moon-shaped horns dragging her chariot um, through, the, through the sky. So there are certainly horns. Um, maybe for the early Christians, they were deemed to be devil's horns, but that wasn't how they were intended from the outset. No, no. I, I, would, I would say that quite happily and categorically, no. Okay, great. But then, but then you see, we, we run into that problem that we always have, is that the intention of the artist and the culture behind the artist is not, all, not always evident to those who come afterwards. Mm -hmm. So for the early Christians in Egypt, who didn't read hieroglyphs, um, who didn't really have a full understanding of what Egyptian religion was, then these probably were devils. These these were these were human beings that looked like that looked horned and were dangerous and monstrous. So yes, I, I could I could see how the original intention could be subverted. Yeah. Um, but no, that would never have been the original intention. It's also if one thinks of dangerous trickster deities from the classical world and one thinks of pan and so forth they're never that sort of horn they're, they're always big they're always big goat horns or little curved back goat horns but these are these are closer to cow horns these are these are benign horns does anyone... are there any other questions Angela did ask, uh, Neptunus is also considered to be a lunar deity, although she is not portrayed with a lunar disc. Is she the lunar opposite of the solar aspects of Isis? Mm. Yes, yes, she, she probably is. She probably is. Um, in which case, my, my discussion of how Isis becomes more lunar over time uh, means that what she's doing is she's absorbing aspects of Nephthys. Um, but she, I mean, she's not, she's not hugely lunar. She's not hugely lunar. She's, she's not, for instance, she's not one of the deities who I thought I ought to be discussing her as part of this lecture. So though she may have lunar aspects, um, she's not a deity who immediately springs to mind as being connected with the moon in ancient Egypt. Is there a lunar aspect to uh, harvesting and growing? Because um, you pointed out the cornucopia, the horn of plenty on the Cellini. Um, yeah. And I wonder whether perhaps the idea of like harvesting and abundance and fertility is linked in with the appearance of the full moon. I know that there is a uh, sort of certain relationships between planting and uh, seasonal crop collecting with I I think to the moon. I think the harvesting aspect is simply that thing that the nights have started to to become longer the daylight is shorter and that you know that we we still have the idea of the harvest moon to this day Mm. So the fact that the nights are starting to lengthen um, 
and, and that I think would be the connection there. Is there any references to uh, what lunar eclipses meant spiritually to ancient Egyptian people? No, um, the, ancient <laughs> the ancient Egyptians are always very wary about saying specifically what such things are for, for very good reasons, because the ancient Egyptians thought that writing these things down would bring them into being, would give them magical purpose. Um, so ag again, it ties back to what I was saying about, about this huge lost knowledge um, the idea that there may have been very, very real beliefs about such things amongst the people, but they haven't made it into the writings, which is very frustrating. Is there any, um, anything referring to perhaps reflections of the moon in water? Uh, I wonder whether something like that could explain some of the ideas about Thoth reconstituting and, re and healing the... I. No, 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 again. Again, I can't think of anything specific. But it may well be, but it may well be something that, that, that at the outset informed the thinking. But, but we, at this, at this distance, we, we can't know precisely how the thing, sometimes we can hazard a guess. I love hazarding, um, I guess. <laughs> I'm not an academic. I th um, what about, um, uh, like, with regard to the moon being this eye, and like we were saying about the protective qualities, do yes. you think people would have viewed the moon as this eye of God in the sky that was watching over them? Oh, yes, in the, sa in the same way that they viewed the sun. Mm. Um, but I'm not aware of any... Baleful, apart from the fact that apart from the fact that it happens at night, I'm not aware of a baleful influence in the way that we have the the baleful influence of the sun. Mm. So, so we have Sechmet, who is positively terrifying, mm. and she's an aspect of the sun, um, and causes death and destruction, as we know the sun does. But the moon generally seems to be a a cheerier character, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Seems not to have the same baleful influences. If anything, it is it is an antidote to the baleful influences of darkness. Okay. Those, the um, those horns have a similarity to like the headrest that you were talking about a couple weeks ago with the dream sequences and everything uh yeah the the headrest that people slept on whereas i, I guess yes. that some people think that the symbol of the headrest echoes the horizon and i yes. i guess you have yes. the aspect of the moon rising above the crescent at the same time as yeah. being the crescent itself yeah, no, no, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely a similarity there. Um, it's part of it is that thing that the moon affords you views that you can never have of the sun. Mm. You're, you're never just, unless there's, unless there's a, a full on solar eclipse, you're never just going to see that little crescent of the sun. And if you do see it, it may be the last thing you see anyway. Um, because looking directly at the corona of the sun is never a good idea. Um, so it does, it does, the moon can be incorporated, that whole thing of the of the the horizon and yeah, but it, is it possible that the I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would want. I'm not sure I would want to put it any higher than the fact that there are similarities between the two. Mm. Um, Is there any idea that perhaps the bull horns are a kind of representation of the horizon on Earth because the bull is associated with the Earth? I suppose. 
No, I, I think I think it's more just I think it's more just the, the crescent of the moon. Mm. Um, and I think I think the reason I, I think it's a weird thing because of course, in reality, one never sees a crescent moon in that shape. Mm -hmm. So it's an artistic convention that that supports Egyptian art to turn it from either that side or that side to just slide it round to the bottom and represent it that way. It's more about artistic conventions than any reality. Whereas the representation of the horizon, yeah, that works with the sun coming up behind, but we don't have that with the moon. I think, I think they're two quite different ways of thinking that just happen to have similarities. Mm. And what, if, what about, for agriculture, we haven't talked about agriculture and the moon is very relevant to agricultural fertility. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Well, we have, I mean, we, we've talked about it insofar as we still have the, the term, the harvest moon now. It ties in with that idea that during harvest times, the nights are getting longer. Um, but again, again, it's a, it's a difficult one because because for the ancient Egyptians, all of the hard work, the harvesting work is done whilst the nights are getting longer. But for the ancient Egyptians, the hard work is the sun beating down upon the, the verdant flooded fields and actually well, both causing parents, crops to grow. Both my parents are farmers from Egypt. And um, okay. That's not really the case, to be honest. Uh, but at least that's not traditionally how we see the farming. Farming at night is actually very, very dangerous because of snakes. Uh, lots of different animals would come. No, 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 no of course, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. What, what I'm trying to say is the connection between the nights getting longer and harvesting during the day is there. But no, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go out to farm at night. I, I wouldn't recommend it in the slightest. Um, but, but that's why, as I say, for the, for the ancient Egyptians, I think the hard work has been done. They can see the sun beating down and they can see things growing. That's, th that's the difference for the ancient Egyptians between the work of the gods and the work of the people going out to, going out to work in the fields. The two but, quite but different from, things. From what, uh, I'm just wondering, from what evidence do you draw that conclusion from? From, from, this, from the same evidence that all of us can see. Um, the Egyptians have very, very clear ideas on doing X, Y, and Z for very little in the way of hard work, and the sun and the water will make things grow the actual involvement of the hand of man in that is slight. Things, things will grow whether man decides to plant it or not. But man makes a decision about what they plant and how they harvest. And those are, those are decisions, but the actual growing function is something that man really can't interfere with at all, unless they remove an aspect of it, and I suppose the only aspect that man can really remove is the water. Iman, I wonder if you know of any um, traditions of planting or things like that to do with moon cycles, because I know that in a lot of agricultural traditions, they plant according to phases of the moon for best growing. There are certain aspects of the, um, the mystery, mysteries of Osiris where they, where they plant the little, um... Osiris mummy. Yeah, the, the, little, the little growing Osiris mummy. They do things like that at certain times. Um, but of course, we're into October by that time, when, when the nights are very long. Um, so just the realities of life are that a lot of that will hap happen under darkness. I know from doing some archaeology in Egypt and Northeast Africa that um, many traditional people also, they, they, they tend to plant amulets at specific times in the moon phase. 
Mm. Okay. That's, why, that's why I was asking about agriculture, if you know more about agricultural um, fertility and how that might have been reconciled. And the reason I ask what the evidence is specifically um, is, is so that I can examine the text myself also. No, I, uh, I don't, I don't have, I'm sorry. That's, that, that was not part of my brief. Um, I've been looking more about the iconography and those aspects, um, the actual fertility planting agricultural aspects are, are not something that, that I've sought to pursue with this. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any last questions for John? Maybe not. <laughs> Caroline, yeah, do you have a question? Um, yeah. I've got one. Um, do you think the crescent moon headdress evolved into halos, read the celestial deities rebirth and that? Well, we we see it to an extent with um with some of these anubis. Well, we are. That's that's still a headdress, but that's that's much that's much more of a halo. Yeah. That we that we see that we see around Anubis there. Um. But again, but again, the the crescent seems to have turned on its side. At this point, is certainly turned on its side at that point. But again, artistic conventions are changing substantially at this point. Mm. Um, so yes, it's, perhaps. It's just really us putting our ideas onto their pictures, isn't it? That's, <laughs> that's, part, of, that's part of the problem that we always have <laughs> with uh, trying to understand ancient iconography is trying, trying, to, trying to see what the original bases of the iconography are and extrapolating it forward rather than trying to yeah. extrapolate backwards. Yeah. Any other questions? I think I'm I'm questioned out. <laughs> John, thank you so much. That was absolutely never been known, never been known before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone for coming and John, thank you so much. Oh, hang on, there's a question. Thank you. Oh, oh no, just thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, my pleasure. It was really great. Just what I needed. And I'm sure it's just what everyone else needed. I'm delighted. <laughs> and um, well, actually, I don't sleep as well during a full moon. So um, we'll see how uh, tonight's moon, full moon dreams go, how prophetic they are or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next talk we've got is Chris Norton talking about uh, the lost monuments of Cleopatra. So that should be quite an interesting one. So I look forward to that and hope some of you can join me for that as well. But uh, I just want to say, John, thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Thank as you. I thank you all. I saw you at the Egyptomania thing at the Petrie Museum and I absolutely loved your talk. You're the first person thank to you. tell me about Mummy Brown. And I thought that was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. So good evening, and I hope you all have a very good sleep. Good night. And a happy new year to everyone when it comes. Happy new year. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. <laughs>